Go this ahead. conference will now be recorded. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, for the record, I have uh, the minutes from that. So let me pull that up right here and get going on that. Uh, so we had a budget committee meeting on June 2nd, 2020 at 1 p.m. And those in attendance were John Harrell, myself, Ian Taylor, Don Schriever, Ryan Kelso, Connie Locke, Melissa Krause, Janice Jessen, Robin Britton, David Hubbard, Kimberly Huffman, John Warren, Josie Smith, Jessica Pfeiffer, Rocio Gallegos, and Darla Arnold. The items discussed, we discussed the, the uh, strategic plan and the COVID-19 planning that was used for the budget process. Ian then briefly discussed New Braunfels being the third fastest growing city in the nation and the majority of expenses being related to capital expenditures based on that growth. Ryan then discussed the drivers for improvement and deficiencies of each system and included a discussion on capacity and water supply, uh, followed by the five-year capital plan for each system. Robin discussed technology infrastructure across the utility system. Timeline and cost of new facility was discussed, followed by a discussion led by Ian about the overall support capital plan and operating expenses. Ian then went over the importance of bond ratings as well as a comparison to other utilities according to the Fitch peer review. The different revenue requirements for each budget scenario were then presented and compared to last year's financial operating plan. Don then presented the fiscal year 2021 financial resorts for the recommended scenario of using a half growth with the new facility and with the GLO uh, project, including debt service coverage, days cash on hand, and debt capitalization in relation to our policy requirements. The 20 year financial forecast was also presented along with revenue requirements. As part of the effort to improve and streamline the budget process, the committee then discussed ways to improve the presentation and discussion, which we're going to be hearing shortly. And that's the end of my report. Okay, great. Thank you. Ian, I'm sorry, John. May, can we, since it didn't record, and I, I hate to do this, but can we take roll again for the quorum? Because this recording does not have any of that in. It just started with Ms. Hoffman's report. And I think just for record keeping purposes, we should do that again, a quorum and um, if y'all don't mind. Sure. Mr. Harrell. Yes, ma'am, here. Ms. Hoffman. Here. Mr. Campos. Mr. Gray. Here. Mayor Brockman. Present. Ian Taylor. Here. Ryan Kelso. Here. Honey Locke. Here. Don Shriver. Here. Melissa Krause. Here. Robert Robin Britton. Here. David Hubbard. Here. <clears throat> and once again, we have established a quorum. Okay, we'll proceed. Okay, thank you, Laura. Okay, uh, any other comments from the chair? Any, any board member have any comments? If not, we'll move to item D, draft budget and five-year plan. One, presentation and discussion, the draft fiscal year 2021 budget and five-year plan. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rocio, if you could pull up the presentation, please. Um, and I do want to apologize again for the issue with the link and the GoToMeeting last time, and we've had a couple of hiccups today as well. Uh, we've been hitting this pretty well, all these board meetings up until this workshop. I don't know what it is about the workshop that's uh, uh, got us a little off kilter, but uh, we've put in permanent, correct act, permitted, permanent corrective action um, to prevent the issue that we had with the posting last time, so we'll not have that again, um, and we will figure out what the hiccups are here today. So as we get into this presentation, um, let me get my screen all set up here now that we're sharing. There, there's two key themes that you're going to see for this budget and this five-year financial operating plan. Um, the first is we're facing extraordinary challenges. I think y'all know that, especially related to revenue from the impacts of COVID and um, that caused this instant recession while we we're in the midst of this record growth. Um, but what I want to assure you is that we know what we're doing. We have a plan that works that you're, you're about to see. It's flexible so we can adjust whatever the post-COVID economic situation uh, ends up being. 
Um, and the plan is built on maximizing the scarce resources that we have to work with. The second thing that I want to, to reinforce, and it's a theme that you're gonna see throughout, is that this plan is driven by compliance. And y'all know what that word compliance means. It's not an option, it's a requirement. And there's two main things that we're concerned with when it comes to compliance with this plan. The first is TCEQ regulation, and that you'll see that represented by and large by our water and wastewater capital programs. And the second is compliance with MBU's own financial policy, which I think we all know is sound policy that's allowed us to maintain best in class reliability um, while maintaining one of the lowest utility bills in the region. And it's a policy that's worked and we wanna make sure that we maintain that. And if we don't comply with these two um, requirements, then the reliability is gonna suffer and the utility bills will be higher. So these investments um, are important, they are required, and this compliance is the number one driver of the revenue requirements that you'll see towards the end of the presentation. Everything else is negligible beyond that. Next slide, please. Okay, here's the overview. A little smaller so I can see it. Can y'all see that okay? I'm seeing part of the slide, but not the whole slide. I yeah, just it, it looks like the left margin's cut off. Yeah. Rocio, can you try shrinking it maybe on what's causing it? All kinds of weird stuff at this meeting. <laughs> Golly. Just when you thought we had this stuff figured out. <laughs> I mean, March was a breeze. I'm yep. looking through it right now. One quick moment. Okay. And Ian, unless it's changed, I have the ver I have both what's live and then the version that was sent out in the book the 91 pages kind of a hard copy that's through a uh director point so that's an alternative as well if if this one doesn't shrink okay all right i appreciate it here we go Yeah, soon and again, I'll tell you what, just turn off the presentation mode and you can just click through the slides. I think we could see that okay before you go into that mode. Okay, say that again, Ian, we're doing what now? Um, just hit escape to get out of presentation mode in the PowerPoint so that it'll show the, the preview of the slides on the left, but the, the slide that you were on showed well on the screen. Yeah, there we go. And just go over to slide two. Yeah, okay, very good. Any issues seeing that? Everybody see that pretty well? Oh, nope, that works. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, here's the overview. We'll start uh, with touching on the strategic plan because that's where this starts. And then we'll get into capital and we'll hit each line of business. Then we'll go into O&M. And from those costs, we'll talk about the revenue requirements to meet those costs. We'll get into the funding sources for those requirements. And then we'll look at the 20 year financial forecast. Next, please. Okay, one more. There we go. Okay, so just very quickly, y'all, just to get everybody reoriented, the strategic plan essentially has us doing planning at a high level and bringing it down to the key focus areas, those things that are most important um, for our utility and those take the form of our strategic goals, the tier one strategic goals. And from those, the point I wanna make here is that the executives down to the directors and managers then come up with the business plans that support each one of those tier one goals. So we have alignment of resources and investments from the top of the utility all the way to the individual contributor. Next, please. And these are our tier one goals. Uh, they're kind of small, hopefully y'all hopefully can see them. What I want to emphasize here is that while each of these key focus areas are receiving um, resources in this coming year, there are two that are receiving, I'd say maybe more and disproportionate than some of the others. The, the first is infrastructure and technology, and um, you can see that what we're measuring there is reliability and resiliency, and so you're going to see investments in technology, of course, water and wastewater, like I mentioned a moment ago, um, and as always, the, the electric system as well. And then the other one is financial excellence, 
And the goal there is a competitive bond rating. And these revenue requirements that you'll, that you'll see at the end are, are really established so that we can maintain that bond rating for, for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Next, please. All right, I think Don picks it up here. <laughs> All right, um, so as Ian mentioned, uh, COVID-19 played a large role in preparing this budget. Um, during the budget process, we were facing extraordinary challenges due to the uncertainty of the impact of growth and to the local economy. Um, forecasting was very difficult. In order to help with forecasting, we built several models. Um, those models helped us predict uh, decreased usage, growth, impact fee reductions, and bad debt. And um, so we've included some things in this um, budget that we don't normally have. So for bad debt, we are anticipating write-offs due to suspending cutoffs. So we've included an amount for, for those. Um, for personnel, in order to offset some of the impacts of COVID, we decreased the merit from 7% to 5%. And for new personnel, we moved the start date from August 1st to November 1st. For impact fees for the first year of the five-year plan, we have those budgeted at half of what we had last year for the first six months, and then at half growth for the last six months and remaining four years. And then um, for growth itself, we have um, half growth compared to what we've been experiencing for all five years. Um, the plan is flexible, so we can respond to whatever the impacts are of COVID. Next slide. Okay, hot off the presses here. I think some of y'all have seen this already. The Census Bureau uh, put this new information out and it essentially says that the latest information is that if you look at the growth of our community going, going back to the last nine years, we rank number three in the nation by percentage growth. And these three bullet points of the impact of MBU have remained the same each year. Number one, the growth has rapidly consumed capacity in our infrastructure, which is what's driving the capital. It strained our workforce, which you'll see data on that uh, in a bit. And then of course, changed customer expectations, which we've been talking about for some time now. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, I mentioned earlier and Don mentioned it too, that our plan is flexible. And being flexible requires an awareness of variables and then planning contingencies around those variables. Growth rate is one of the more significant variables that we've contemplated when developing this year's budget. And since the greatest economists in the world can't agree on the economic forecast right now, we don't presume to know either. Uh, so instead, instead of trying to guess at what it's gonna be, we sought to identify the boundaries of what growth would most likely look like in the post-COVID uh, world, um, or, or COVID going forward and then post-COVID. For the lower boundary, you're gonna see uh, in a bit that we selected 1% growth. And for the higher boundary, we selected what you see here, which is half of our post-recession, post or, or pre uh, COVID growth rate. We had to pick one of those rates, although we knew what the guardrails were and we knew those boundaries going forward as we got into developing the budget. We had to just at least pick one so we can build a budget around. And what we did was we settled on the half growth rate scenario. And, and you might wonder, well, why not use the, the pre-COVID growth rate as the high boundary? And the reason is there's two things at work here. First is whether the growth rate is zero or it's 7%. A significant portion of the water wastewater capital that we have planned must be built regardless just to catch up with the growth that we've already had and get us back into compliance and second with the higher the growth rate the higher the impact fee revenue and other revenue to help pay for the capital so in other words there is a fixed capital investment that must be made regardless of the growth rate so at some point the higher the rate the better off we are from the additional revenue but so hopefully that kind of explains how we ended up with the the boundaries that we selected uh, but like I said earlier, we, we selected the half growth rate as the one to build the budget around. And you'll see as we get into this, the other variables we used and their impacts on revenue requirements. Next slide, please. Okay, one more. All right, so I mentioned um, compliance as one of the two themes for this year's budget, specifically regulatory compliance and the water wastewater capitals programs that will bring us back into compliance with TCEQ. And this is a good graphical representation um, of the impact of compliance to our revenue requirements. So 10 years ago, the budgeted source of expenditures 
uh, were ha roughly half and half between O&M and capital. And with the water and wastewater capital programs that we have now, they are now the majority of our expenditures um, and everything else to some degree really truly is negligible. And so you're gonna see a big focus in this presentation on those programs. Next, please. Uh, this is uh, this is supposed to communicate good news. <laughs> and so what this is showing here is, uh, well, we all know that we've been climbing this 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 growth. We, we've known this capital is coming. It was not a surprise. We've been building and ramping up to it simply because these projects have a timeline. You can't just implement them in that first year. There's there's years long projects. Well, in 2021, we're going to hit the peak of our planned capital, and from there we'll start dropping off. And so by 2024 and looking forward. We should be at a more regular pace and we'll talk more about the 20-year forecast at the end of the presentation but what i want to show you is where this this capital program is compared to historical capital and future capital next please all right good afternoon board this has been a very unique planning cycle with many challenges with the uncertainty that came with the pandemic MBU master plans all of its systems, and as a result, we're able to be agile and flexible as growth speeds up, or in this case, slows down. Over the last two years, we've built our plans around an assumption of 6% growth. We are now forecasting growth rates to fall to roughly half that. And what you'll see in this presentation is an adjusted capital plan built around that assumption. With all that said, our driver for electric system improvements remain the same. First and foremost, we design our infrastructure to meet regulatory compliance. The second driver is centered around proactive operations. We plan system improvements to ensure that we provide the expected level of service at the absolute lowest cost. We have a tier one goal to maintain organizational reliability and resiliency that we measure with the KPI of SADI. Our goal is to maintain a three-year rolling average SADI, which represents the average outage duration of each customer served in the top quartile of Texas utilities, or less than 52.56 minutes, which represents roughly 99.99% reliability. This is a lofty goal that we consistently achieve. We track Stady very closely, and this metric, metric is a great indicator of successful maintenance and aging infrastructure replacement programs. We could try to drive Stady to zero, but that makes no financial sense. Instead, the MBU board has set met metrics to strike the perfect balance between affordability and reliability. We also have planning goals that keep customer counts per feeder at or below 1,000, ensure system capacity is always greater than system demands, and importantly, we properly maintain aging infrastructure to extend each asset's useful life. Next slide. Here's a look at MBU's reliability in 80 minutes. As I stated on the previous slide, SADI represents the average outage duration for each customer served. With SADI, lower is better. As you can see on the graph, MBU has consistently outperformed all other sectors of the industry. MBU's great reliability stats are a product of sound planning and sophisticated preventative maintenance programs. Next slide. This graph shows our electric system capacity. It is our goal to maintain a system capacity greater than our system demand. The orange line represents our historical and forecasted system demand for electricity, and the blue line represents our electric system capacity. Each time the blue line moves upward, we're adding a new power transformer. This may be a brand new substation or simply a power transformer addition at one of our existing substations. We design our substations to allow for expansion to accommodate growth in the future. Highlighted on this graph are a couple of years where our system demand, demands actually outstripped our system capacity. Operating in that condition increases the likelihood of equipment damage, system outages, and exponentially increases losses in our electric system, which translates to a revenue loss. As you can see in the graph, the capital plan successfully maintains a system capacity greater than system demands. Next slide. This graph shows the number of electric distribution feeders in our system and the average customer counts of those feeders. A distribution feeder is a power line that carries the, elect the electricity from the substation to the distribution transformers. Those distribution transformers are the transformers on a pole outside of your house or out in your front yard if it's an underground system. 
Like I said earlier in the presentation, our goal is to maintain a customer count for a feeder below a thousand. The old adage, don't keep all your eggs in one basket, is a good way to think about that strategy. Limiting customer accounts per feeder improves reliability and offers more flexibility when load switching is required for plane maintenance or emergency repairs. As you can see on the graph, the blue line, which represents our customer count per feeder, trends below 1,000 customers through 2025. Our electric capital plan has the addition of 10 new feeders to accomplish this goal. Next slide. This graphic shows NBU's electric service territory outlined in red. The existing 12 substations represented by red dots, planned transformer additions or replacements represented by the yellow triangles, and planned substation additions represented by the blue dots. The electric capital plan calls for the addition of two new power transformers at existing substations, the replacement of two power transformers, one that's an aging unit and one unit that failed earlier this year, and the construction of one new substation in 2023. Next slide. This slide shows the significant projects in our five-year electric capital plan. Some large items to note are the power transformer and feeder additions, and also one new, new substation. In the table, you'll find a few acronyms. T and PWT stand for the same thing, power transformer. In this context, I'm talking about the high capacity power transformers in the substation. Also on the slide, you'll see a UD conversion project. That project will convert an overhead line that's located in a backlot easement in the River Tree subdivision to front lot underground. Backlot easements are expensive to maintain and present both safety and reliability challenges. The conversion of this line will save MBU ratepayers money in the long run and make for a better customer experience for those in the affected neighborhood. Next slide. So here's what the plan looks like. The majority of the plan is in place to support growth and development with 19% of the funds allocated to replacing aging infrastructure and the remainder is split between contractual obligations and IT projects. Next slide. Water system improvements share the same drivers with electric. First and foremost, we design our infrastructure to maintain, to achieve rather, regulatory compliance, which ensures the protection of public health. The second driver is centered around proactive operations. In this area, we have planning goals that ensure we properly maintain aging infrastructure to protect our investments and extend each asset, asset's useful life to most efficiently manage the systems at the absolute lowest cost. Next slide. Currently, our water system is not compliant with TCEQ regulations as it is deficient in elevated storage, production, and pumping capacity. What you'll see in this five-year plan is a path to compliance in these areas. We also experience operational problems resulting from aging, insufficient aging infrastructure investments, and we continue to see tank non-recovery through peak water demand season. Next slide. So here's a high level look at our current non-compliance in the water system. As you can see, we are not compliant in the areas of elevated storage, distribution pumping, and production. The implementation of our five-year plan will result in compliance in these areas. We're in the process of conducting a self-audit and have reported to the TCEQ that we are out of compliance. To avoid potential fines and penalty, we have submitted what are called alternative capacity requirements that would on an interim basis allow us to achieve compliance with lower standards. Our initial request was denied and we're currently reworking the ACR for resubmission. The reason for denial was the way we calculate our connection counts. For capacity management purposes, we developed a new methodology to track connection counts per pressure zone based on an equivalent connection methodology. The method proved to be more, a more exact representation of our connection counts versus our previous methodology, just using the water meter counts. Some issues with using meter counts are that apartment complexes only have one meter, but in reality, they represent a larger demand than just a single connection would. So our new method is, is more exact and better for planning purposes, uh, but we're, uh, like I said, we're reworking the ACR per the TCQ's request. Next slide. With growth, we continue to see increasing water demands on the system. 
This slide shows a comparison of 2018 and 2019 during peak season. The blue bars represent daily water demand in millions of gallons. The dashed horizontal line represents the prior year's total system capacity. And the solid horizontal line at the top of the graph shows the total capacity for the year of the graph title. As you can see, we've added capacity to our system each year. And had we not, we would not have been able to keep up with peak day demands. Next slide. Even with this added capacity, we still have days where we have to mine elevated storage to keep up with demands. The shaded blue area of the graph show daily water demands. The red dashed line shows our target storage volume, which are the amounts, the amount of water in the tanks around the system. And the black line shows the actual surplus or deficit in those tanks. As you can see, even through periods of increased demands, our system performed better in 2019 than it did in 2018. This is a result of our interim capacity projects. But anytime we have a pump failure or a main break in our system, the situation still becomes critical because of a lack of contingency in our system. The ultimate impact of tank non recovery is pressure loss and possibly boil water notices. Next slide. As I said on the previous slide, we have successfully implemented capacity projects to improve water system performance. On this slide, you'll see a handful of examples of those projects. The Trinity Well Field and Membrane Treatment Project brought an additional 3.74 MGD of production capacity to the north end of our water system. The County Yard Pump Station Project connected the Copper Ridge pressure zone to the MBU water system, resulting in a more reliable and resilient system for their customers at Copper Ridge. Next slide. The surface water treatment plant pump number four and the Seguin Interim Interconnect pump station projects brought, in a, brought a combined two and a half MGD of additional pumping capacity to the water system that was critical for peak demand management last summer. Finally, the Bresky pump station phase one addressed existing pressure issues and also increased our effective elevated storage, bringing us closer to TCEQ compliance. Next slide. Here's a look at our elevated storage regulatory requirements. Red X's indicate being out of compliance. You can see here that there is a need for additional elevated storage across the system. The capital plan that we put together addresses this issue of non-compliance. The far right column on this page contains the projects in our capital plan that will bring us into compliance. Those are mostly elevated storage tank additions and a few pump stations. Next slide. Here's a look at our pumping regulatory requirements. Like the previous slide, red X's indicate being out of compliance. You can see there's a need for additional pumping capacity across the system as well. The capital plan that we put together addresses, addresses this area of non-compliance. Similar to the last slide, the far right column contains the, the projects that are going to address these areas of non-compliance, mainly pump station additions and expansions. Next slide. This slide really tells the story of just how tight things are in our water system. The graph shows projected max day demands and blue bars. Our existing system capacity, which is 27.3 MGD, as the black dash line, and our planned water system capacity in the red dash line. In 2019, we managed through a peak day demand of 26.8 MGD. This was extremely close to our existing capacity of 27.3 MGD. With margins that tight, you literally have to bat a thousand to avoid draining tanks and losing system pressure, which would trigger boil water notices and disruption of normal life for our customers and local businesses. As you can see, our planned system improvements will increase our water system capacity and allows for some contingency in case of failure. Our five-year plan will build resiliency into our water system. Next slide. I'm sorry, the animation for this slide is not going to work in this uh, this setting, so bear with me. Um, so we've, we've gone through a, a very granular effort in nature to understand the number of available connections in the water system down to the pressure zone. Now, if we take a regulatory line at the issue, we would not allow any connections to the water system in the zones behind this chart that are in red. The downtown hey, you, know what, you know what, Ryan? This, is, this really is a good... 
this really illustrates things well. Rocio, can you try, yeah, try to see, see what it looks like on this slide. All right, fingers crossed, come on. <laughs> Uh-oh. Now, Ian, That's you funny. messed things up. We had such a good <laughs> no problem. These were going so well until I opened my mouth. Threw, threw a wrench in it, it's all right. Okay, bear with me one second. We're gonna get this pulled up here. I think I, I think it's worth the time to, to do this because what, what Ryan has put together here is what's the external facing communication piece to the development community on how we're managing uh, to pace new de new development with our capital projects instead of just saying we don't have the capacity we can't allow new development we've taken a risk-based approach to allow it to happen because that new development brings new revenue in and it helps pay for these capital projects so hopefully this chart will be able to, to come up and be able to see it Okay, does anyone have the presentation handy that they can load? It, it's freezing on me now. It doesn't want to let me open it back up. Yeah, here, let me let me try sharing mine. Oops. Um. Slideshow. And you know you'll learn how to do all this, and then they'll upgrade the software next week and change it. <laughs> all right. No yeah. doubt. Agree, Ian. <laughs> so to Ian's point, if we took a regulatory line at this, we wouldn't allow water connections or any new connections to any of the zones that you see on this page that have red numbers. And like Ian said, we just we can't afford to do that because we're if we're not allowing new connections to the system, we're not collecting the impact impact fees, and we're not able to fund the projects. So Ian, if you would advance the animation. So we've developed a process that allows us to operate in what we feel is an appropriate amount of risk. We're updating these numbers monthly, and like Ian said, we're meeting with the development community on a quarterly basis to communicate uh, where we're at with CIP completion. Next slide, Ian. Thank you. So, oh, it's still up there. I, yeah, it's still up there. I, I see something else across the front of the slide, though. Oh no. Back up one. Here, Rocio. Let me give it back to you now. Just like you were doing it a minute ago. All right, guys, closing it and reopening it. It's just gonna take a couple of quick minutes here. Don, do you happen to have that presentation handy that you can provide? It, it's not wanting to reopen for me. I'm on a loaner laptop so I can have a camera and I don't have access to the drives for some okay. reason. I, 
Let me see if maybe Darla can pull it up one quick second. Y'all see that? Yes. Okay, go ahead, Brian. All right. So here's what the plan looks like. As you can see, the majority of the capital plan is geared towards achieving regulatory compliance with the remainder addressing growth and new development and aging infrastructure. You can see that a small portion of the CIP is in place to fulfill contractual obligations with either the city of New Braunfels or developments outside of our CCN. Finally, roughly two and a half million is in the budget to support the ASR project. The two and a half million will support the completion of the demonstration well only and fund continue operations and the study of the project. Next slide. Ian. The general land office, which is more commonly referred to as the GLO, solicited proposals for development of a 1963 acre tract of land located northeast of New Braunfels. The proposed development lies outside of the city limits and MBU CCN, which would mean MBU would serve the development only by contract. The development contract will outline the developer's responsibility for the cost of their pro rata share of the improvements necessary to serve the development. We will also require a payment of a water supply fee to cover the cost of purchased water for the proposed development. We ha we've had extensive talks with the developer and we are currently drafting the development agreement. Next slide. So we recognize the importance of getting this right. So we commissioned an unbiased third party engineering firm to conduct a peer review on the planning and modeling that was performed to create the CIP. The ultimate findings were that the planning and modeling was conducted correctly and successfully addresses the areas of existing non-compliance. Next slide. Next. Now we'll move on to wastewater. Are there any, uh, let me, let's pause this real quick. Are there any questions from the board members on what you've seen for water? I know a lot of it's what you've already seen before, but uh, since it is such a big part of the, the program, I just wanted to pause just briefly and see if you had any questions. No, Ian, I don't have any questions. I have okay. none. Okay. All right. All right, go ahead, Ryan. All right. So finally, wastewater, Ian, if you would advance the slide. Wastewater has the same drivers for system improvements. First and foremost, we design our infrastructure to achieve regulatory compliance, which ensures protection of public health. The second driver is centered around proactive operations. In this area, we have planning goals that ensure we properly maintain aging infrastructure to protect our investments and extend each aspect's, asset's useful life to most efficiently manage the systems at the absolute lowest cost. Next slide. Currently, our water, I'm sorry, currently our wastewater system is not in compliance with TCEQ regulations as it's deficient in wastewater treatment capacity, pipeline capacity, and lift station capacities. What you will see in this five-year plan is a path to compliance in these areas. We also experience operational problems resulting from insufficient aging infrastructure investments. Next slide. So here's a high-level look at our non-compliance in the wastewater system. As you can see, and as I said on the previous slide, we're not in compliance in lift station, wastewater treatment, or pipeline capacity. The implementation of our five-year plan will result in compliance in these areas. Next slide. With wastewater, the TCEQ requires that you begin engineering design of a plant expansion when flows reach a threshold of 75% of your permitted plant capacity and you must begin construction of the expansion when you hit 90%. As you can see in the graph, we reached the trigger to begin design of an expansion at McKinsey in 2023, and the construction trigger is hit in 2024. The construction of a two and a half MGD expansion of the McKinsey Water, Rec Water Reclamation Facility is in the five-year capital plan. Next slide. We are currently unable to meet our discharge permit requirements at the existing green water reclamation facility. 
MBU received a notice of violation and ultimately an agreed order with the TCEQ to correct the capacity issues at the existing green plant. The new plant that we are building off the loop will address the capacity issues and also move the plant out of the, out of the flood plain. The new plant will be online in the fall of 2020. As you can see, the new plant capacity will serve future growth without need for expansion through 2028. Next slide. The existing South Keeler water reclamation facility was constructed in phases since the late 1950s, and many of its treatment components are nearing or have reached the end of their service life. The existing North Keeler water reclamation facility was constructed in the mid 1980s, and many of its treatment components are nearing or have reached the end of their service life. We have budgeted for a rehabilitation of the critical treatment components of these two plants. As you can see in the graph, the rehab work will require us to take portions of the plants offline, which will reduce our treatment capacity. As you can see, it is imperative that we perform the rehab work in the next five years. Otherwise, we will lose the opportunity to do this work until the next plant expansion, which may not happen for another decade. Next slide. We've made significant progress in our efforts to achieve compliance. On this slide, you'll see some of the substantial projects associated with those efforts. The Dove Crossing lift station addressed a pumping capacity deficiency and created capacity to serve future growth. The McKenzie Water Reclamation Facility increased our system treatment capacity and removed a large lift station, which improved operational efficiency. The Rio lift station bar screen project automated operation of the bar screen and increase the effective capacity of the upstream collection system. Next slide. Next slide, Ian. There you go. The green interceptor and water reclamation facility relocation project is currently in progress and will increase treatment capacity and eliminate a large lift station that is beyond the end of its service life. The North Keeler Interceptor project's design is complete. This project will address wet weather overflows and provide capacity for future growth. Next slide. On this slide, you, sl you see in red the alignment of the North Keeler Interceptor. The interceptor follows roughly the Dry Comal Creek, Comal, and Guadalupe Rivers within the city limits. The North Keeler Interceptor overflows during peak wet weather events. That means during heavy rains, we risk overflows into our rivers. We have completed design for the project and have sought the right of eminent domain from city council to acquire some of the easements. We plan to begin construction this fall. Next slide. This slide shows the existing and future available connections in our wastewater system. As you can see, we are currently overdrawn in the majority of our system. These deficiencies are either in treatment or pipeline capacity. And as you can see, the capital plan will resolve these deficiencies, the red numbers turning to black. Just like with water, we're taking a risk-based approach and are still, still allowing new connections to the system as we move towards compliance. Next slide. So here's what the plan looks like. As you can see, the majority of the capital plan is geared towards achieving regulatory compliance with the remainder addressing growth and new development and aging infrastructure. We also have some contractual obligation to design and install a sewer extension to support the new continental facility, but MBU will be fully reimbursed for these costs by the 4B. Before we move on, I'd like to answer any questions you might have on wastewater. I don't have any. Looks great, Ryan. All right, thanks, Bob. All right, Ian, thank you. So what we talked about earlier in the presentation is water system infrastructure, the pipes, pumps, tanks, and plants needed to deliver water to our customers. In this section, I'll cover MBU's water supply, which is MBU's permitted right to just access the water. So here's a look at our current water supply portfolio. On this pie chart, you'll see that a portion of our supplies are undeliverable because we currently lack the infrastructure to treat, pump, and store the water. Some of our projects in our CIP will increase the amount of deliverable supply that you'll see on the next slide graphically. 
Next slide. So this graph shows the forecasted demands in the blue bars, our maximum contracted water supply in the green line, and finally, our deliverable volume, uh, it, which is represented in max and firm in the black and the orange lines, respectively. So as you can see, the completion of our infrastructure projects and our capital plan increases our deliverable volume which allows us to better utilize our contracted supplies. Essentially, we're trying to get that black line as close to that green line as possible uh, on the appropriate time frames to better utilize our, our available water supplies. Next slide. This is a look at our historical and future water supply costs. The big driver of these costs are associated with the mid-basin project that MBU has contracted 8,000 acre feet of water from. As you can see in the graph, MBU's water supply costs will increase by five times over the next five years. Next slide. In 2018, MBU conducted a water resource plan to evaluate new supply opportunities to meet the needs of future growth. MBU evaluated the potential supplies against 14 criteria, including the cost of supply, when making decisions of which supplies to pursue. On this chart, you'll see some of the supplies evaluated in green and the supplies that MBU selected or currently has in blue. As you can see, the water supply we added to our portfolio as a result of the water resource plan is attractively priced compared to some of the alternative sources. Next slide. So here's a more detailed look at our water supply costs. The left column shows the supply source and each column shows the yearly cost of that supply with the far right column showing the five-year total for each supply and a grand total for the five years at the bottom right, very bottom right. And uh, with that, if y'all have any questions on water supply, I'll be happy to answer them. But with that, I'll hand it off to Robin to cover the technology portion of the presentation. Thank you, Ryan. Hey, Ryan, this is Bob. A quick question on your last slide, the water supply detail. Everything seems fairly consistent, uh, except for the mid basin and Seguin supplies. Is that an escalating cost or more volume? Or I understand. I think mid basin is it coming online, but the Seguin costs uh, almost like two and a half times up. That's a that's a really good catch there, Bob. I'll start with the Seguin water. The Seguin contract had an escalator built in. Initially, we only had available to us a portion of the 2,500 acre feet that was to make up the total of the uh, of the contract. So in, and I, I can't remember exactly the totals over the first four years of the contract, but it, it stepped up annually as Seguin was able to make available additional water to us. So we pay uh, for those additional acre feet um, each year. And then it finally tops out at 2,500 acre feet mid basin, uh, what you're seeing there is the, uh, you're exactly right, it's not coming online until 2023. Right. Sorry, I apologize for how small this table is. It's, it's really impossible to see. There you go, thank you. Uh, but as you move into the out years, we're paying the full cost of Mid Basin to include the, the capital cost associated with building the infrastructure to treat and deliver the the water in that project. So initially we were just paying uh, fees associated with uh, the water supply rights. And now we have started seeing some of the, the debt service costs that GBRA is passing through to us associated with that project. And in the future, as we start to take delivery, we'll begin paying delivery charges based on the amount of water that we take on an annual basis with that project. And those estimates are in the plane as well. Don, if I missed anything, please feel free to add. Okay, so I was just going to add that um, for the Seguin water source, it started out at 1,100 acre feet with an escalator of 500 acre feet per year um, to top out at what Ryan had said. And then for Mid Basin, um, a little oddity there is um, we did use GASB 62 to defer some of those costs. So um, you'll see until we start getting that water in 2023, we defer deferred some of those costs and then we'll start capturing those over um, a 10 year period. And then Ryan is right, the um, debt service comes on in 2023. Um, GBRA is partnering with Texas Water Development Board 
on their financing and MBU is committed to pay that debt service. Um, however, we also have in our impact fees, um, the um, cost, the principal cost of that um, infrastructure. And so as we collect impact fees, we can start reimbursing some of that towards ourselves. So that's all I had to add on that. Perfect. Don, Brian, thank you. All right, are we ready to move on to technology? I know we've had some challenges today, but please don't hold that against me. It let's us know we have a little room to grow. All right, so I wanna go back to what, what Ian said at the beginning of this, um, and the focus of this technology budget is on maintain that tier one goal of maintaining operational resiliency and reliability. And that includes all of our, our areas that you'll see here. So I'm gonna start um, and look at the electric side of the house. Um, often we look at how our network is internal to our offices, but what we're gonna be focusing on is our mobile network. So how our network is operating for our field folks and make sure that they have a reliable network that they can use in the field to get that data back. We're going to be looking at um, some vegetation encroachment on our electric operations, using, utilizing our drone program to um, do some analysis with that, as well as continue with our, our smart street lights program. On the water and wastewater side, um, we'll continue with our real-time link detection. That is the satellite imagery that um, Brian has spoken about previously with uh, doing link detection, as well as pressure monitoring and then the manhole sensors. The, uh, the uh, environmental folks will be getting, continuing with the customer side leak detection and water meter health monitoring using the operations op optimizer software that we have in place. So on the um, systems control side, we'll be looking at a pilot pro project for um, water only. In the water only area, we don't have electricity that we're serving. And so we have an issue with access points and getting that data back into our network. And there's some new technology with uh, some dedicated uh, band frequencies that is very promising that we're gonna be looking at in that water only area so that we can become fully AMI. We're also gonna continue with our disaster recovery center. As you may know, the plan for our new facility is also linked to our development of the disaster recovery center as well as redundancy for our server room. Um, and finally, we'll look at some AMI integration with analytics. And that leads me into our data strategy group. And we have made a move in our data strategy group in this next budget year to look at moving that server infrastructure in-house. So the point of that was to remove some of the uncertainty that occurs with cloud infrastructure and be able to minimize um, that variability. So we'll be moving that in-house and continuing to work on executive dashboards and reports. And many of, um, one of the executive dashboards that we created was a financial dashboard that we used as part of creating our budget that you see here today. Um, and finally, we'll look at predictive and prescriptive analytics and modeling. Right now, what we're doing is sort of taking in the information, looking at it and see what it's telling us. What we want to move towards in the following years is being able to say, okay, here's what we think is gonna happen based on what's been happening in the past. And prescriptive modeling is more like, if we make these changes, what impact will that have on us? So, and you'll see a little bit of an example of that in just a second. Finally, with our, our IT group, we'll be working on our network resiliency and reliability and our security that goes along with that. We've been moving, as many of you know, to some new hardware infrastructure. And in the next year, we're gonna be looking at performance improvements. We want all of the systems to run very well and very quickly so that everyone who is you know, being productive and in the field can keep, keep working. We're gonna also look at PCI compliance, which is uh, compliance with credit card and security. That will enable our customer service folks to um, have a little bit more functionality. And finally, some good housekeeping things like standardizing your PCs, your phones, and your printers and continuing to integrate this into an enterprise solution for our monitoring and alerting so that we know about issues before our customers have to call us and tell us about it. 
So with that, I want to show you some of the data analytics that we've been looking at as part of this uh, process. This is our financial dashboard that the data analytics group put together. And this one screenshot that you see right here is of our late accounts. So it tracks our late accounts for people who have at least one late payment. You can look at the number of accounts by what category they're in. And it gives you kind of a, a overall look at where we stand with the late penalties. Now, you'll notice at the bottom there are several tabs. So we have the year-to-date uh, revenue, year-to-date on new accounts. Um, and this is very small text and my eyes are not as good. Um, but looking at, at late accounts and accounts um, in detail. So this gives you a full picture of what our financial financial um, situation kind of looks at. And it, it helps Don's group and my group and everyone to take a look at that. But sometimes this can be a lot of information to take in. So if you'll move to this next slide. So what we did is we created some summary reports and it gives you um, a snapshot of where we stand and you can look at the reports that are a little bit more condensed and then we can offer some commentary of this is you know based on this information that we're seeing for our financial situation and the financial situation for new brothels here's what we can expect in the market so if there are any questions i will take them and if not i'll hand it back to ryan if i could just make a comment real quick about the importance of these dashboards you know we for those of us who have to make decisions you've got to have you got to have the information to make an informed decision and when we're facing situations like like what Robin is showing you here in the way of impacts from COVID to penalties and late payments, or in um, not too long ago, it's it, last summer, uh, having a dashboard to show the, the, the condition of the water system and building models to forecast what the future demand is gonna be day to day because we're running so tight. These are, um, they're pretty, they're nice, uh, but and I hope you see that, but I hope you also know just how important it is to be able to have this information at our fingertips so that we can make those calls day to day on how to best manage the business. All right, well with that, I'll hand it back to Ryan. Thanks Robin. And I'll echo Ian's comments. Those, those dashboards are extremely valuable in trying to make business decisions and day to day calls in some cases. All right, we'll move on to facilities. In 2019, MBU wrapped up a facility master plan and the result of that plan was that MBU was out of space and the plan prescribed the construction of a new centralized facility to house all MBU employees. Next slide. As part of the move, MBU will be selling both the downtown office and the service center. On this slide, you see the anticipated cash flows for those transactions. MBU could very simply sell these facilities to the highest bidder, but that is not the path we're taking. As a trusted community partner, MBU recognized the need to do two things, protect the historical features of the downtown office and ensure the building is developed in a responsible manner. To accomplish this, MBU will conduct a two-step buyer selection process in which respondents first provide qualifications followed by a proposed business plan and vision for redeveloping the property. Upon MBU's selection of the buyer, MBU will develop an agreement for selling the property that will ensure the vision is executed as proposed. To ensure protection of the historical features of the downtown office, MBU worked with the City of New Braunfels, Downtown Board, Historic Landmark Commission, and the Planning and Zoning Board to develop an overlay district for the downtown office. The historic overlay, I'm sorry, the overlay district outlines specifically what we can and cannot do to the property and the buildings to ensure historical protection. As for the service center, the city of New Braunfels expressed a strong interest in the property and we have been working on a deal that would involve a sale lease back of the facility to allow MBU to continue to occupy the facility until a new facility is constructed. The terms of the deal will, will involve a lump sum payment uh, in FY21 of $5.1 million and an annual payment thereafter of $500,000 through FY31. Next slide. Not so long ago, on May 28, 2020, the MBU board approved a design contract for a new centralized facility. The design work is soon to kick off with Marmon Mock, and we anticipate a design completion in June 2021 and construction completion in September 2022. 
The total design and construction budget for the project is roughly $48 million. But when netted with the proceeds from the sale of the downtown and the service center offices, we arrive at a net cost of roughly $34 million. And with that, I'll hand it off to Ian to, to review the support capital plan. Okay, thanks, Ryan. So we've gone through water, wastewater, electric, water supply, and this is the summary of the support capital plan. And you can see that the majority of it is facilities, and the majority of that is coming from the project that Ryan just described to you, which is have, has a few moving parts. It's selling two existing facilities and building a new one, um, and using the proceeds from the sale of the others to apply to the new one. And one of the things you're going to see when we get to the revenue requirements in a moment is what it looks like for us to proceed with this project and not proceed with this project. And it's an important question because it doesn't just affect MBU. As Ryan mentioned, the city of New Braunfels is, uh, is who we're negotiating with right now to sell the service center to. Um, and so that has benefits for the city. If the city is able to acquire that property, they have to make a considerably less investment for a public works facility. I don't want to speak for the city. I'll let them, I'll let them do that, so please don't quote me on this. Um, but it, it allows them um, to manage their facilities at a much lower cost than they normally would otherwise. It also allows their public works uh, function to move out of the South Castell area, the old uh, city hall, which frees up that area for the South Castell project to proceed as well. So there's some, some dominoes that'll fall by MBU uh, initiating this project. And that's why we wanna show you what it looks like to have this project in the, in the plan and out of the plan. And then uh, beyond that, you can see the other, the other items here. We have some IT items, uh, physical security, and of course we have um, the headwaters here as well. And moving on from there, we'll get into O&M. So, You've already shown this slide. I just wanted to put it back up again, just to put this discussion in context. Everything you just saw is the orange 80% bar, uh, dominated mostly by water and wastewater. What I'm gonna talk about now in the way of O&M is this smaller blue bar right here, which is 20% of the budget. And when you look at O&M, really there's two main categories that come, it breaks down to. I'll talk about each one individually. The first is personnel, and the second is non-personnel. So let me get into personnel first. We've been sharing with the board for a, a couple of years now just how um, strained our workforce is primarily because of growth and the impacts of growth and so what we've been what we showed you last year for the first time was this analysis we put together to get a feel for how efficient or inefficient we are. Are we, are we doing what we are we doing the best we can with the resources we have and, and what we've shown here is three different utility types that we can compare ourselves to on a meter per employee basis. So there's only one other utility in Texas that we are aware of that is like us, meaning it has water, sewer and electricity under a board of trustees and that's in Brownsville. And if you look at Brownsville, you can see that if we were to have an equivalent number of meters per employee, we would need to add 156 employees to our current workforce just to get up to their level. That's a 42% increase. On the electric side, we compared ourselves to CPS Energy, our neighbor to the south, Garland and Bryan, Texas Utilities, and it's a, it's a bit of a mixed bag here. So I think on the electric side of the business, we're not too far ahead or not too far behind. I think we're right, right around the middle there. But if you look at our comparison to SAWS, you can see that in order for us to have an equivalent number of employees, we would need to add 168 employees, which is a 37% um, increase is what we'd be looking at. So the way we interpret this is, you know, we got these three lines of business um, and it's the water and wastewater side really that's understaffed, but it's not just the folks within those lines of business. As you know, there are support services throughout MBU that support these lines of business as well. So what we've been working with uh, the board on for the last few years is trying to correct this issue of resource uh, of strained employees because of the growth. But we also have been talking about, we can't just add them all in one year because that, that doesn't work for rates. So we've been slowly adding them in. And what we have planned um, starting next year is to have 14 employees and then 12 each year after that to try to close, close that gap down. It won't get us equivalent to our peer utilities, but it's a, it's a measured way of adding resources that helps get us to where we need to be 
And we're very strategic about specifically which positions are added each year because we have a list of 50 something positions uh, minimum that our, our managers want next year, like is in their short right now. I um, mean, we just can't, we, we all know we can't do that. And so we take a very close look at what those needs are and it's a hard choice coming up with those that get added each year, but it's what we're doing right now. So I mentioned that O&M is personnel and then non-personnel. Here's some of the key non-personnel items that we have included in the budget this year. And you can see they really break down into a couple different categories. One, there's that C word again, compliance. So it doesn't just show up in capital, it shows up in O&M as well. And then these strategic initiatives, if you look at the, the nature of these, what you'll see again is a lot of IT investments. And it's something that is so important to us. You'll recall we added that to the tier one goal measurement a couple of years ago because it's so important and because we need investments there because it's not just focused on water, wastewater, and electric. IT supports all three of them. And we've got to make, make the investments in that infrastructure in order to keep all three of them going. So you're going to see that we're continuing to make investments there. Okay, so I just talked a lot about costs. Now it's time to look at the other side. It's time to look at revenue. And our rates are based on cost of service. So now we're going to get into the revenue side in order to meet those costs. So the last place we look for revenue is from raising rates. Revenue comes first and foremost in cutting costs because costs we, the costs we don't have is revenue um, that we don't don't need to go find. So much of what you see here, we, we continue to show this to you year after year of the things we've been doing. A lot of this here is related to efficiencies that we've been able to gain through innovation. A couple of things to, to point out this year that I think are, are interesting. Number one, uh, the customer side leak detection program, which is right here. We just received a statewide award from TCEQ for the conservation um, side of this and, and the work that we've done here. So not only is it saving money, it's an incredible conservation act that we've taken here. And the other one I'll point out, y'all, our healthcare premiums are flat for the seventh year in a row. And I would challenge, I'm, I'm looking for another co company in the country that has done that. I mean, it's absolutely incredible what we've been able to accomplish through our work with um, our healthcare broker and also the hard work of our employees through the wellness committee and all the work that our employees are doing uh, to emphasize wellness in their daily lives. So a lot of good work's been doing here. I've uh, been doing here for cost cutting. And then after looking for ways to cut costs, then we look for new revenue sources. Like I said, rates are the last place that we want to look. Um, and so we want to look for revenue sources. And you can see that um, in this, over the course of this five-year financial operating plan, we have about $5.4 million worth of estimated revenues in there. And we're also, just before COVID hit, we were negotiating wholesale water sales, and we've put those on hold right now. Uh, but as you'll recall from our water rate design last year, we have a line item in our water rate where we can take the revenue from these sales and deduct that from what a, a utility customer needs to pay for their bill. So there's an opportunity there to, to save additional money. And we're going to pick that up, pick up those negotiations again, um, not too, in the not too distant future when the time is right. So the bond rating, this is very important. Um, you all know this and it's worth talking about here because it, it's one of the things that drives the revenue requirement as well. So the bond rating directly impacts a customer's monthly MBU bill. Every month, it's a direct impact for two main reasons. Number one, the cost of debt. Uh, the interest rate for bonds is based on our bond rating, of course. So the lower the interest rate, the less you pay. And then the cost of energy, which is 76% on average of a, of a customer's MBU bill. So if a customer has water, sewer, and electric services from MBU, 76% is just the cost of energy that we buy on the competitive wholesale market through ERCOT that we pass directly through to our employees, to our employees, to our customers with no markup. So the higher the bond rating, the more qualified of a counterparty we are and the less collateral that has to be posted. So this bond rating is very, very important. And one of the reasons we're able to maintain that bond rating is because of the, the board's financial policy. And in the financial policy, there's three key, three key ratios that we need to keep an eye on and maintain. We need to have the revenue in place to support these three key things, debt service coverage, days cash on hand, and debt to capitalization. So on this slide, this is a slide you see each year. 
Uh, Y'all know how excited we were this year when we had our rating reaffirmed as the pandemic was unfolding. Um, after we had just gone through record growth, they continue to reaffirm our bond rating, which is something that everybody on this call can be very proud of because this is not just decades of good governance and good management and good policy, uh, but in the near term, just really making good decisions with the interest of our customers in mind, trying to keep their bills low. And you can see uh, here we are uh, at AA, and the only one higher on this listing is CPS Energy at AA Plus. But if you look at their revenues, I think. I don't know that we'll ever get that level just because our revenues aren't, aren't on par with them. Um, so we've essentially, uh, you might be able to say, you could argue we're at the highest rating we possibly could be, which again, directly impacts our customers' monthly bills. So let's talk about revenue requirements one last time. So we're we'll about to get to what those are. So our rates that our customers pay are driven by the revenue requirements. And the revenue requirements are determined, number one, by the cost of service, we went through uh, quite a bit of slides on that. We got to maintain regulatory compliance um, and, and we got to do the things we need to do to make sure that we're providing safe and reliable water, wastewater and electric systems. And there's no profit built into them because we're community owned. We look for opportunities to cut costs and add non-traditional revenue sources. And then once we've done all those things, what we do next is determine what is the revenue required in order to maintain that bond rating by achieving those three ratios. So this is what they are. Now, if you look at this top table, this is straight out of our five-year financial operating plan last year. And of course, there's a year missing because we're in that year right now. These are the requirements that we had identified in last year's financial operating plan that was approved by the board that we eventually gave in our annual update to city council um, that we use in our presentation for um, discussing rates and our rate strategy. Well, in this year's uh, budget and five-year financial operating plan, things aren't as certain because of COVID-19. So instead of dialing in on a single revenue requirement estimate per year, we've done that where we can, but you can see in some of these years, what we've done is we've put in a range of what those requirements most likely will be. And if you go back to early on in the presentation when I was explaining that we, instead of trying to guess and look at the crystal ball what the, the future is going to be, we, we found the, the guardrails, we found the, the boundary conditions, so to speak, of what we think will eventually happen. And that's what those ranges mean. So if you look at fiscal year 21 and just take that note that year individually, we're looking at no additional requirements in electric and water. We're looking at a range from 20 to 30 percent and wastewater 16 and a half percent. So the one that changed out of those three from last year uh, is water. And you can see that it could be as low as what we predicted last year, or it could be as high as 30% based on how things turn out. And we'll talk about that more in just a bit. And as you go through the years, you can see that electric are very, very modest revenue requirements. You can see water and wastewater, they pretty well match that, uh, that bar chart I was showing you of capital investments required by year. So in 21, that's gonna be our highest requirement. You see it show up in the revenue requirements. 22, we drop off a little bit, and then you start seeing the drop as you get in the out years. When we get past that hump of making those investments in capital to get us back into compliance. Now, this next slide I'm going to show you is real busy. And we had the budget committee meeting. The next slide actually preceded this slide. And the feedback we got was, oh my gosh, you're killing me. It's too much. So we swapped them, right? Uh, but we wanted to show you where the ranges came from. And the importance of this slide is that we've shown you on this slide three of the important variables that we uh, that we changed in order to and modified in order to try to get an understanding what the revenue requirements are going to be. So first is growth, right? The growth rate we talked about that earlier, and that's probably the biggest one out of all of them. On the left, all of those scenarios are based on the half growth scenario, which is the growth rate that we chose to model this entire or to build the entire plan around. Those scenarios on the right are based on 1% growth. And then within each one of those, we change two other variables. One is whether we include the new facility in, in the plan or we do not include the facility in the five-year plan, meaning we go ahead and build the new office, uh, the office facility, and then we sell downtown and sell the service center, or we do none of it and sit on it for now. The other variable is the land that's owned by the Texas General Land Office. And the reason this is in here, and the reason it has such a big impact, it's, it's twofold. Number one, 
that project requires quite a bit of infrastructure that needs to be built. But the second thing is the development agreement that we would end up negotiating would have requirements in there that the developer uh, provide funds to us in order to pay for their impact on our systems. And so you can see that when you take the GLO out, it actually increases the revenue requirement. And so time will tell what's going to happen with the GLO. That thing has been out there for many, many years, as, as you all know. There are prospects that are, are looking at it, continue to look at it. The GLO has solicited proposals to have developers come in and develop that property. Um, and so what we have an exact we have an idea of exactly what we would need to do if that developed. We know what it would look like. So no matter what happens out there, we just implement or not implement whatever the plans that we've already made in advance. You can also see that the impact of the facility is only about 2%. So if you take the facility out, you the revenue requirement drops uh, by only a couple percent. So it's it's uh it's pretty small compared to the overall requirement, which is driven by primarily the water and wastewater. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Don. Okay, <clears throat> so the rest of the numbers are based on that first scenario that um, Ian showed you, uh, which is um, the half growth for the five years with the new facility and with GLO coming on. So um, on this slide, this shows our ratios and our policy requirements. So you can see the first ratio, debt service coverage, it's very important to the rating agencies. They wanna make sure that we're generating enough cash to run the system and make debt payments. You can see that MBU remains above its 2.4 coverage ratio as a combined system with fiscal year 24 getting the closest to that threshold. On debt to cap, MBU remains below the 50% requirement with fiscal year 23 and 24 having the highest percentage, um, and that's due to the debt that we're issuing to construct the capital. And then days cash on hand. Um, it's above what we currently have in the policy of 140. We would like to get that number up to at least 160. Um, the rating agencies noted that that's one of the areas we could improve on. However, to raise it, um, we would have to increase revenue requirements to generate that extra cash. Next slide, please. Next slide. All right, so this shows the funding source, uh, the funding by source for capital. Um, MBU uses all available sources before issuing debt to fund the remainder of the capital. So for this plan, we have 57% of the capital will be funded with debt, 16% from revenue, 14% from contributions, and 13% from impact fees. Next slide, please. So this shows the debt that we'll be issuing by year. Um, we're planning on issuing $341 million in debt over the five-year plan. And you can see the first three years are really where um, we're issuing the most debt. And um, we need to get through those first three years to get the capacity we need. Included in this debt is the um, debt that we're planning to issue with Texas Water Development Board. Next slide, please. Uh, impact fees are one of our important sources of funding, and we use that to fund growth projects. Uh, this shifts the burden to the customers that are necessitating the new capacity. We'll be undergoing an impact fee study in fiscal year 22, right after we um, complete our water master plan. All right, now I'll turn it back to Ian. All right, thanks, Don. Okay, we're on the home stretch here, y'all. What, what I want to do here is show where our customer utility bills are in New Braunfels right now. We've shown you the revenue requirements, but I think it's important now to go to where we're starting from. and what, what is the baseline here? So we're gonna go through each line of business based on an average residential. So an average residential electric bill is about 1200 kilowatt hours. You can see we're second from the bottom as far as what that bill costs uh, along this, this I-35 corridor something we're very proud of. And, and you'll recall from those revenue requirements, they're very, very modest, you know, one to three percent. And so we don't see, uh, we don't see ourselves moving much in that ranking. Residential water bill, this is for 6,000 gallons. Y'all, this, this is not an average. This is less than average. This is 
folks who do not irrigate. This is water that's required for life. It's essential water. It's for bathing, preparing food, drinking, that kind of thing. So as, as you know from our past conversations, this is the most important volume block because people cannot live without this. You can see that MBU has the very lowest utility bill on the corridor on the, within the entire region for that amount of water. So while the revenue requirements were highest for water, you can also see that um, sometimes, sometimes uh, utility bills are a reflection of investments needed, right? And I think that that's what you're seeing right here in the way of water. So let's take it up a step and, and, uh, and let's let, before I do that, I mean, you can see some of these folks are in the city limits of New Braunfels. And you can see what some of these folks are paying for water just to drink. We're talking on the order of 50, 60, 70, close to $80 a month. This volume residential for residential uh, irrigation of 25,000 gallons, this is a pretty normal amount of, of water, watering of a lawn, of irrigation. It's not real, real high, it's not real, real low, it's kind of in the middle. So you can see even the on-peak rate for people who are using discretionary water is very, very low, very low, especially compared to the investments needed to supply that water. So if you look at, Ryan talked a lot about water infrastructure, talked about water supply. If there was no lawn watering, we essentially wouldn't need to build most of that or, or buy most of that water. And I think that's an important, important concept to, to say out loud because those investments and the size of that capital plant is needed uh, in large part for irrigation. And so when you look at that revenue requirement for water, a lot of that's gonna go into the irrigation volumes to make sure that the folks who are driving those costs um, are paying for those investments that are needed for that service. This is a chart that we just started showing last year because I think it's interesting. What it does is it illustrates that MBU's water infrastructure needs are not an NBU thing. It's more of a Texas thing. It's more of a, an I-35 corridor thing, meaning folks who are in this high growth area are, are necessarily needed, needed to make these investments in water infrastructure. And so you can see the five-year rate uh, um, history of changes and what it would cost a customer in each one of those communities to pay for 6,000 gallons of water. And you can see that not only are we uh, not the highest in percent change, we have the lowest utility bill out of any of these folks. And so again, while we have a high revenue requirement for water, we're also uh, very, very low. Now let's talk about wastewater. Talk about electric, talk about water. Let's talk about wastewater. Wastewater, we're more in the middle. Uh, we're right just below the average of our neighboring utilities. And you can see that if you compare the same type of percent change and current bill amount to the folks on our corridor, um, you can see that we are on the on the upper end of the percent change, but our current bill amount is still um, second to the bottom. And the other thing about these other folks is, you know, going back to the very first part of the presentation, none of these folks are third fastest growing city in the nation. And that kind of strain, that kind of stress really puts a unique requirement on a community and their water wastewater infrastructure. So if you add it all together and you look at a utility bill, so this is a this is representative of a utility bill for an MBU customer that has all three services from us, water, sewer, and electric. And you compare that to a utility bill in San Marcos, San Antonio, Austin, and Seguin, you can see that even on peak, we're the, we're the lowest. We're the lowest out of all of these. And if you look at the, if you, what's interesting here too, is look at the proportion of the different services. The smallest one here is water, and water's the one needing the biggest percent change. So that's good news. That's good news because the biggest one here, the orange one, is the one that requires no change for this next, this coming year. Not only that, 76% of this right here, this orange bar, is being driven by our bond rating, which makes us a worthy counterparty in ERCOT, um, which, which allows these costs to be passed directly through to our customers. So we're in a very good position as far as affordability. Okay, I'll turn it over to Don here. <laughs> All right, we're on the home stretch and we only have a few slides left. So the last thing we're gonna talk about is the 20 year forecast. Um, MBU prepares a 20 year forecast and it's a tool that we use to help with decision making. Um, the further out you get, the 
maybe rougher it gets because there's so many unknowns. But what it's really helpful for is to make sure in those first years outside of that five-year plan that there's no unexpected things that will, you know, that you're going to fall off a cliff and you just don't know about it. So it's a really good tool. And what we're showing right here is our 20-year forecast for capital projects. And when you look at this, you can see, just as we've been showing you in the five-year plan, that um, we do have significant capital needs in those first three years. But then as you go out in the 20 years, you can see it levels off and um, we have moderate capital needs. Next slide, please. All right, so um, this is our 20 year forecast for debt service coverage. And um, you can see that um, our ratios do decline in those first years, but we start to recover as we pay off and have less of a need for debt. That spike you see in fiscal year 22, that's a direct result of um, GLO coming on board and a potential water supply fee that they would pay us um, in the amount of $33 million. So that contribution would drop directly to the bottom line. Next slide, please. All right, so this is our 20 year uh, debt to cap forecast. And it also recovers um, in those out years as we have less of a need for debt due to less capital needs. And next slide, please. And this is our last slide. So um, we do run revenue requirements for those out years. And what you can see here is though, even though rate increases are needed, especially in those middle years, they are much more modest and they even start to decline in those last 10 years. And that's um, all we have except for discussion or questions. Hey, Don, it's Bob Gray. I have a question. On page 65, we talk about half growth. Is that 2 to 3 percent? You know, half of what we discuss on page 7, what is half growth? Is there a number or percentage growth on that, sort of what the guardrails would be? Um, it's page 65, revenue requirements. Okay, so when we're, yes, when we're talking about half growth, and I'll let Ryan chime in also, but basically what we're, when we say half growth, what we mean is half of the growth that we've been experiencing over the last couple of years. So okay. we are anticipating that we may see a slowdown in growth because of the uh, coronavirus and some of the effects on the local economy. And was that... And so specifically, what is that number? Is our number the last few years has been seven, eight, nine percent, or we are 5.2 percent in fiscal year 20? I was trying to find what that number is. And, and uh, so I think Ian just had that chart up. Somebody did. 2.1 percent for FY21, 3.3, 3.2, 3. Page 7. Yeah. Can y'all can y'all see that? Are y'all seeing? There you go. Yeah. Yes. Now I do. Yeah. Okay. But we, we talk about half growth, and that half growth is, you know, kind of the guardrails, but it's sort of for folks who aren't as in the weeds as we are. I'm always like, half of what? So it's if we say 2.1 or 3%, I think it's much more descriptive. And we also caveat an asterisk, this is slower and expecting a decline from what we've seen in the past. But half growth could be 50%, but it's, um, we all know it's not. But it, um, I think just a little bit more description uh, on that when we have external discussions and discussions with council and uh, members as well. It's good okay. feedback, Bob. Thank you. you know, if I could, if I could just kind of summarize a few things, just land the plane here a bit. Uh, not that I want to end it. We'll have plenty of discussion, but. Some, some closing thoughts, and I'll end where I started, and it's around these two themes that I feel like this year's plan has in it. Number one, what we've put together is designed with flexibility, so no matter what happens going forward, um, we just respond because we've already planned higher growth, we've planned lower growth, we've planned for all these different contingencies, and so it's not a rigid, locked-in plan because things are uncertain going forward. Um, and the second thing is compliance. It's the number one driver of our revenue requirements. Um, in fact, on the, the capital side, anything beyond that capital, although it has an impact, it really is 
overall negligible compared to what that capital plan that capital plan is. I would say too, and this came up in, in the uh, budget committee meeting, I, I appreciate this sentiment. What you see here is that we're not kicking the can down the road. Ryan mentioned to you that we went to the TCEQ and said, we are not in compliance. And we want to show you the plan that we have that we are currently implementing to get us back into compliance. What we could have done is waited until their inspectors came for an inspection. They got the numbers from us and they said, you realize you're out of compliance, right? And then it would have been a different conversation with TCEQ. We've gotten out ahead of it. We've told them what's going on and we're negotiating with them right now uh, to see what kind of remedies there are uh, to, in order, like Ryan said, these alternative capacities that we can come up with. Uh, so we can best manage the situation that we're in right now but we're not kicking the can down the road we're doing the responsible thing and what you're seeing is what happens when you're the third fastest growing city in the nation water and wastewater is is a heavy capital uh, heavy civil type industry and it just takes big investments in order um, to make sure that you've got compliance and the level of service that you need but on but but we're in a great situation because our rates right now are very competitive and uh and low compared to to our other communities so we're in a good spot for making those investments right now and then we're not alone we're not alone in needing this infrastructure we see it in other utilities in the region we see it reflected in in the trends for their rates not only that we see it within our very own community for the different agencies in our community that are tasked with providing service to the public you see uh courthouses and you see schools and a jail and and all the projects the city is doing right now we're right there in the middle of all that. We're in, I'm proud to say we're doing that as a team. I think we're all pretty well coordinated in this community, making sure that we're doing the best we can to provide the best value that we can. Um, and I'd also say, I think one of the last things I'd say is that, you know, I think the total capital over the five years, I don't think we put the total on the slide. You've got it in the handout and what we gave you. I think it's 555 million in five years in required capital. Uh, but to think that our rates are as low as they are, even with that capital requirement is really pretty incredible because at the end of the day, we have our strategic plan and it's where we need to go. But if no one asks us for our strategic plan, what we're headed, where we're headed, they're going to say two words probably. They're going to say, we need you to be reliable and affordable. And that's where we are. Um, we're, we're, we're very affordable. We're one of the best and our reliability, gosh, Ryan shows you the Sadie numbers. It's, I mean, it's top quartile stuff. It's really pretty incredible. So although we have big needs, I'll tell you too that I believe we're in a very good spot and we're in a good spot from, from decades of good governance and good leadership and I believe we've got a good plan here. Any question, any discussions that y'all would like, like to share? I would only agree with what you're saying as far as any outside communication we have, whether it be we've talked about it during our budget committee meeting. Anytime we go talk to folks, Rotary clubs, Lions clubs, anytime we get out in front of the public, We've got to emphasize that what we're doing is a is a responsible, prudent, paced growth investment, capital intensive, yes, but it's a must down the road. And everything you said, we we are in a good spot. Um, but if we don't do it now, it will certainly get worse. But we're only we're only setting ourselves up. Look at that twenty year plan. I mean, it's going to get better and better and better. And we've got to put ourselves. We're not doing anything we should be doing. And that, that includes that facility. I mean, I think that that's got the GLO, the, the, the new facility, all that's got to be in the plan. Ian, yeah. uh, go ahead. I may have uh, missed, I got interrupted a couple of times. I may have missed a discussion on reserves. Did we talk about reserves? Go ahead, Don. I don't believe we had anything specific in there. We talked about days cash on hand, but I don't know that we went into that. The, uh, so, um, I'm had, sorry. We had an earlier discussion about, you know, figuring out where that sweet spot is, what we should have in terms of reserves. I think it's very important to look at that on a regular basis because that's one of the things that allows our rates to be low also because we have that strength, financial strength, and when you're not issuing letters of and you're not doing other things to provide security for people that produce us, produce or generate for us. Uh, that's real, real important. So. Um, I will add that we do have reserves built into the plan. Um, we did draw down on our power stabilization fund. Um, 
in the month of March, but um, we are filling that back up. And then also um, our contingency reserve, both of those are dynamic and they're based on 90 to 120 days. The power stabilization fund is based on 90 to 120 days of power costs. And then the contingency is based on 90 to 120 days of operating costs. So as those move, so do the reserves. And so those are built into the plan. Good job. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just want to make a couple of comments. One, it's like drinking out of a fire hose, listening to all you guys that have been around for a while doing this good stuff. And then also just reading through the, the information that has been sent out. And um, I, I will just a couple of comments. One, having been a customer for the last 34, 35 years, I know how important and special MBU is to the community, whether you're an old timer here and been around counting on you for a long time or whether you're you're brand new here. And as as you look forward, I kind of liken this to wrapping a, a making a good baseball. You know, you've got a core there and the core is all of you. And uh, that core uh, has a lot of partners. And every time you wrap another part or string around that core, it may change colors or it may change the look of how you're wrapping it, but everybody's depending on you guys and gals there at NBU to provide a, a, a service at a good, uh, a good quality service at a good price. I think you've done more than just providing the good price uh, because the service that I think we get uh, out here in the community is exceptional. Then the other part to this is, is there's some more of that string that wraps around that core and that's the partners that are outside the community. And obviously, you know, it didn't, it's, it's not easy to work with folks that you don't necessarily deal with on a regular basis, but it is huge to be able to see that partnership and being able to get water resources, working with GBRA, working with TCEQ, even if you have to walk in the door with your hat in your hand and say, hey, you know, we're not there yet, but look what we need to do. And we understand it and uh, and we are going to get there. And so I, I just think it's um, I mean, I'm excited about being part of this team and watching everybody play their positions because it's obviously, a, you know, a, a team that's hit more home runs than you have foul balls. And that's what's so neat about uh, about this community and, and NBU and how we work together with everybody. So. The planning, the forward thought, the the past planning, and and uh, keeping keeping on the right track is is phenomenal. So um, I, I think that there's you know lots of opportunities here, and we can uh, um, again. I'm excited about being part of it. So thank all of you for everything you're doing, and thank you for keeping uh, keeping us uh, up to speed on what's going forward ahead, Ian and everyone. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, let me do. Uh, let me do last call here. Any any final final thoughts? No, well, I, I I would just like to thank everybody, um, Kimberly and all her team, and Dawn and. It was a lot of work. I know that y'all scrubbed as hard as you can and with the COVID. And then when you look at the entire presentation, the strength is there. We have a fantastic story to tell. And I just continue to be impressed with the amount of capital that is going in and the growth that we have uh, and the quality of the utility and just the quality of life that we can do it with some of the lowest rates in this area. Um, that is just unprecedented, and, and that's a story that I just hope we uh, share loudly uh, across the board. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it. And I, I agree with Judy. I was uh, way on the outside of this, but it's it's it looks great the second time around <laughs> from a few days ago. Uh, question, will this be an action item for next week's uh, board meeting to approve the, the budget? Don's yes. nodding her head. I see That's Don. correct. It'll be on the June board meeting to approve the, the budget and the five-year financial operating plan. Okay, very good. I just, I, you know, back to my sort of, what's our sort of contraction? We still expect growth, but just a little bit slower than what it's been in the past, but 
I'm always like, what does slow mean? Does that mean 1% or, you know? So I think when we communicate this, as John mentioned earlier, board president is we're still growing. We have to com comply on our water and wastewater. Uh, and we are doing that and that we're doing that in a responsible way while still taking care of existing customers. So I think it's a, it's a good message and it's done with a financial, uh, 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 review and financial discipline. So looks great to me. In the world of urban planning, um, the basic kind of give you some perspective of what does it mean at 3%, 7% growth. When cities are experiencing any kind of a growth, 3% is about the maximum that you want to grow at that you can still maintain uh, building the infrastructure that is needed. It's kind of a basic rule of thumb that anything beyond 3%, the growth is going to outstrip uh, a city's capacity to keep up with its infrastructure, which what we have been dealing with for multiple years. So, uh, you know, to have half growth, really it's slowing down, but what it'll allow us to do is to manage growth um, that any basic urban, urban planner would love to have because 3% is the sweet, sweet spot on that and anything above it uh, is just horrific. So that's maybe a little bit of the context around what that means. I had not heard that before, but that is, uh that matches my experience very well i'm glad to know that that's actually a thing you know i think of the years we grew at three percent and it was it was comfortable it was good you know it was a nice modest growth we keep up with it um but yeah as soon as we, we went beyond that it was just you just can't build fast enough and the the most the the upper end uh, when i would teach this i would tell students you know because they would have conversations about this and they say well what's the absolute worst case scenario and basic books and scholars will tell you it's seven and eight percent growth. So there you go, Ian. <laughs> That's where we are. That's where we've been. That sounds like a city I know. <laughs> <laughs> On a slow year. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. sure uh, the city of New Braunfels will make urban planning, uh, urban planning textbooks that we will be a case study. I'm sure. <laughs> well, when we were first named the second fastest growing a few years ago. Uh, a friend of mine and who has a similar role in the community, he said, why not 26th? You know, <laughs> maybe 26th, do we have to be second? That'd be great, it'd be a lot easier. Uh, I totally get that sentiment. All right, well, very good. Um, Mr. President, that is the last item that we have for you today, aside from the journey. Okay, it's, uh, unless we have any more visits to come before the board, it's 449 and we'll stand adjourned. Happy Father's Day, everybody. Yep. Thank you. See y'all next week. Yeah, see y'all next week. Thank you.